Good afternoon, uh, or morning for some of you. Uh, kia ora. I'm, I'm not going to do the, the haka, maybe, well, maybe at the after party tonight, but if you really press me on it. Uh, these are some of my books, and um, um, I am going to be working on this new one, but this current thing is really a work in progress, very much so. It's not complete, it's not prescriptive. And uh, this is the first time I'm giving this talk, so please bear with me. It's going to be some rough spot, I'm sure. And be, by work in progress, I literally mean that instead of 10 tips, I brought you 12. I figured, you know, I'm coming all this way from California. I might as well deliver a little bit extra stuff. So my tip number one is to really think about your entire UX practice as this math science lab. And this actually happens to be... Um, uh, Edison's uh, actual laboratory. So if you think about it, that kind of fits in with where I currently am at GE and what I'm trying to make, uh, make happen there. And really, when you do that, and when you frame it in that way in your mind, that's going to prepare you and prime you for a lot of things that are not going to go so well, and you're going to be frustrated, and you may not like the outcomes and so on, but just keep trying, right? This is all crazy experiments, right? If your Frankenstein monster refuses to rise, then just have Igor fetch a different brain. Or, you know, try another shock of voltage to kind of get your monster up. But uh, above all, don't get frustrated, right? Just, just think of it, you know, there's no right way to do UX, right? That's, that's the biggest kind of outcome. Whatever works in your organization, that's the right way, right? So always be flexible and try different things. So let me break down the remaining uh, conversation into three parts. So the part one is set up for success, and that's going to be where we're going to talk about how to set up your team and um, uh, help them succeed. And then part two, sort of day-to-day -day operations and how, how we make the business of UX happen and what you really need to collaborate with developers and business and so on. And in part three, we'll do some kind of ninja Ninja uh, secrets that uh, hopefully you can uh, you can take some some deep insights there, and take your stuff to the next level. So let's dig in. So who do you hire? Do you hire specialists, generalists, unicorns, uh, you know, kiwis, mythical beasts, whatever? Right. So um, for my part, I prefer to hire generalists, and I call this growing UX ninjas, and. Even if you can't find people that are good at all these things, like content and interaction design and visual and so on, uh, you, you try to get them into the team, and you try to really look for other um, um, sort of other attributes, the soft attributes as well as the hard stuff, right? So this is what I mean by UX Ninja. You have, you know, on the left side, you have all your sort of left brain stuff, and you're, you're able to just, just your your skills, right? You're, you know, you've got to do a design. You've got to be able to interview customers. You've got to be able to um, sketch really well. You've got to do all of these things, run rapid iterative testing and evaluation, and, and so on. But on the other hand, you have this ability and enthusiasm and desire to learn and desire to collaborate and desire to interact with different people and interpret broad directions and then be really an advocate, right? So uh, you have to be an empowered free thinker, able to handle more situations on your own. And, and really, what, I, so what, I, what I'm really talking about is being your intensely practical leader. Right. That's really what I mean by a UX ninja. So rather than looking for a specific skill set for my team, that's what I look for, is, is that enthusiasm and, and leadership ability and desire to learn and contribute. Um, and of course, you've got to design, too. Yeah, that's kind of a given. So my, my tip number three is to designate a lieutenant. And uh, let, me, let me just walk you through what I mean here. So if you are assembling your UX squad, right, uh, you got your commander on the top, and then you got some UX ninjas that can kind of go in and out of different situations and fill different roles, uh, and then the visual designers. I, I consider that a separate skill set, and uh, they are just have a, just a different sort of uh, set of... Um, set of skills and set of requirements and priorities, but the rest of the people are very much interchangeable. So my interaction designers, information architects, user interviewers, et cetera, they, they rotate into different roles, and they're, so they're able to cover different areas of the product as well. So if you have a really large product, 
you don't want people to get bored, and also you don't want sort of this feeling of, oh my God, if this person leaves, the whole bus is gonna you know, blow up, right? So you, you, you rotate people, and that prevents burnout, and that adds fresh ideas and fresh thinking to your process, so that everyone collectively owns the product. And that's a really important piece. And so your visual design lead and your visual design ninja then cover that entire area as well, where they, again, are responsible for the entire visual setup of the whole product, right? And we'll get back to that in a second. That's a, that's a really important point. So, uh, and the reason why I say designated lieutenant is because there's just so much minutia that you have to deal with as a UX leader no matter which step you are, whether you're lead, director, senior director, VP, whatever, it doesn't really matter. E, you just have to deal with so much stuff, especially at a large corporation, that having a helper is, is super helpful uh, if you want to be hands-on. If you want to be just people manager and kind of, um, you know, that's, that's, that's your thing. But I, I want to be hands-on as well. So for that, uh, lieutenant is super helpful. Just be aware that person is most likely going to replace you uh, when you leave and when you turn your back, you know, that's what that ninja blade comes out and <laughs> off you go. <laughs> so choose wisely. Right. So, on to part two. What do we do with day-to-day -day operations? Well, next thing I want to talk about is failure. Uh, now, what do I mean by this? Uh, this is my tip to you is uh, go read this book. This, this book changed the way I lead. And it's called Extreme Ownership, and uh, is by Jocka Willick and Liv Babin. And I highly recommend you get the book on tape, to to get the full sort of intensity of these US um, Navy SEALs guys. I mean, these guys are just intense. They're like probably the most intense people you ever meet. And uh, they just go, and this, you have to do. Duh. You know, it's like, it's, it's really cool. You have to, you have to listen. I can't even, I can't even pretend to do that. But, um, Practice what it teaches. And what it is, literally, is the total responsibility for failure is a difficult thing to accept. And taking ownership when things go wrong requires extraordinary humility and courage. But doing just that is an absolute necessity for learning, growing as a leader, and improving your team's performance. Now, what does that actually mean to us as UX leaders? Well, it means this, in my mind, that the credit belongs to your entire team. But if you screw up, it's on you as a leader, right? It's a very, very simple division, right? So as a leader, you are responsible for success of the team. As they say, if you have a, um, 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 you know, a symphony orchestra, right, and they sound terrible, it's all conductor's fault. But if they sound great, you know, it's them, they practice, they're great, right? They did it together. But if they sound terrible, it's conductor. So keep that in mind. So this philosophy, in my mind, extends to all of the team members. Uh, that, that is my short sort of credo here. Uh, it's, like I said, it's pretty democratic. I prefer people to rotate their specialties. Everyone's responsible for the entire uh, product, not just specific area, which means by necessity, anyone can speak up in our internal meetings and say, hey, I don't really like this. We should try something else. And because we are so customer-centric, we can say, sure, no problem, go muck this up. At the next usability test, we're going to put these two and do an A-B test. And we're going to find out what's happening. Most likely, you're not correct, and neither, neither is the old version, but it's some kind of blending of the two. And it's happened so often that people just kind of are prepared to contribute and not to fall in love with their, with their darling ideas, but instead to really stay focused on delivering the product. So. Um, uh, like I said, we, we stand united for our clients. What, what, does that, what does that really mean? Well, it means in internal meetings, you can do whatever you want, but when you are presenting to the external teams, you have to be on point. You can't be going, oh, that's Joe's design, and he really stinks, and let me tell you why I'm better, right? If I see that, that's, uh, that's backstabbing, and you do it once, uh, you get a warning, you do it twice, you're off the team, right? You just don't tolerate that, because in the large company, you have to have your story straight. And, and you have to be an advocate for the UX. Because not everyone is magically born into this, right? You understand. There's people still wondering, why the heck do we even need a UX department? And by, by all means, why do we need to talk to users and so on? 
So zero tolerance for backstabbing is an important thing. So we all sink or swim together, or not at all. And there's no hole in some other side of the boat. This is, this is our boat, right? We all own this boat. So as, as George Washington so rightly said, uh, we, uh, we all must hang together or we will surely hang separately. So we practice that. So how do we then use this total ownership commitment? And much like the previous speaker, I think I'm going to make the same point here. So um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this concept here. Uh, this is menacing and mysterious. It hangs in space. Nothing goes in, nothing comes out. I call it, ta-da, the Death Star, <laughs> right? So, but remember my tip number one, right? It's a math science project. So we don't want to blow up the Death Star. It's okay, right? What we want to do is make it Lego style. This Opa Lego style, right? So we want to make it Lego style. So, so that we can see inside, right, a little bit. And we can, like, see that what that Wookiee developer over there is doing, or the guy that looks like a Wookiee and, you know, I'm not going to go there. But, um, right, or, or that uh, Lord Helmet, the uh, Scrum Master, is, is up to, right? And there he is fighting with Leia again, right? And they're up to their usual tricks. So, so that's what I mean. You know, don't, don't blow it up necessarily by just trying to kind of try to penetrate it. But how do you do it in a practical manner? How do you gain that power that, that, that she was talking about? Uh, great talk, by the way. The, what you do is you fully participate in their Scrum activities. You show that you have skin in the game. You show up to the introspectives. You show up to the daily Scrum meetings. You show up to the sprint backlog meetings. Every single meeting that Dev is doing, you show up to and you deliver the report as one of the team. And you just start doing that. And if they think it's weird, well, golly, you know, after doing two, three times, they're not going to think it's weird. Now, what's the corollary to that? You have to have your shit together. Pardon my French, right? You really have to do this first inside in your own team. You have your stand-ups. You, you do this to where you can knock this out in 10 minutes or less, like for a small team. You literally have a stand-up, and you do it so stringent, you have to be like the model citizen of the agile process. You have to really limit, don't go rambling about all the cool stuff, don't go showing designs. You know, this is not the time for that. This is, this is what I did yesterday, this is what I'm gonna do today, this is where I'm stuck and I need help. Next, literally, like 30 seconds, boom, boom, boom. And when you got this down, it shouldn't take long, then you move on to participating in the scrum. And then everybody's like, wow, you know, we have to up our game. Because these guys really, you know, they're designers and look, they got their stuff together. This is awesome, right? So, so that's really the way that you penetrate the Death Star, right? You show you have skin in the game, right? You guys heard of the chickens, chickens and the pigs, right? You, you know what I'm talking about? No? So chickens, it's, it's an agile parlance. So in, in agile parlance, you have chickens and you have pigs. And um, the, the story goes that um, a chickens and a pig wants to open a restaurant. And uh, when they do, <laughs> it's a breakfast place, right? So they open a, bre a breakfast place, and, um, and, and, and the chicken tr says all these ideas, right? And, and the pig turns to, turns to the chicken and says, look, for you it's just the eggs. For me, it's my bacon. Right, so, so you have to have your bacon in the game, right? You have to show that you're fully committed to the success of the project. And then you are willing to shoulder some of the responsibility. And when you commit to something, you better deliver on that. Right, so, so that's, the biggest, that's the biggest thing. So you start by penetrating this Death Star and pretty soon you become the central pillar on which the entire process rests. Now this is both a, a power and a responsibility, right? Just like Spider-Man said. You guys remember that. With great power comes great responsibility. But really, even though this is not gonna happen overnight, when you think about it, this is the natural progression of things, if you will. This is what we mean by saying that organization is becoming customer-centric. That means UX is the pillar on which everything rests. Now that is a lot of responsibility. So how do we get there? You start with the daily stand-up. You start showing up to the daily stand-up. 
And then you show up to the sprint backlog and you say, okay, what are we doing? These are our designs, look, we come prepared. We have everything you need for the next sprint. And this is how we recommend you start. And by the way, this is why, because we have these other things are coming, right? That allows the developers to say, you know, they're, they're, they are okay. We can work with these guys, right? So you're just one of the boys or girls developers. So when you're up and running properly, when you got everybody's trust and you got everybody's buy-in, uh, you get to the steady state of one of your UX ninjas in one scrum. That's usually kind of your ideal situation. And uh, it, they attend each scrum meeting and become an equal member of the dev team. So they're fully supporting that scrum. And then the UX lead is rotating into whatever team needs a little bit extra help or um, needs a little more muscle, right, or expertise. So that's, that's really the ideal situation. So how do we then empower our team members to become these ninjas, right? Because if you are by yourself, right, you have to have these ways that you operate, right, these credos and these rules that are gonna make sure you're part of the team, but at the same time you can operate independently and so on. So the way I like to do that is by making as many policies as possible. Now, it, doesn't sa it, it sounds really kind of serious, but when somebody comes and asks you a question, one question does not a policy make, right? But if two people ask me the same question, then I go, aha, uh -huh, time for a policy, right? What do I write it up? So I know the, uh, those guys in the back cannot, cannot read this. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, um, by golly, but I'm gonna try to read a couple of lines here for you guys. So, um, JIRA policy, it has come to my attention that I missed a few comments in JIRA and critical tasks have been delayed due to this. My bad, again, total ownership, right? Thus, I thought it would be helpful to restate the JIRA task policy and help streamline our operations. JIRA is a great tool, thank you, Lucy, yesterday, um, uh, for making that a great tool, but it has a few quirks, so she still has some work to do. Uh, <laughs> If we follow the policy, we can minimize any critical misses that impact our partners and customers. Eye on the ball, right? Jira does not show us when you ask a question in the comments. If you need team member to answer something, please add your question in the comments and then assign the story back to that person. Please do not close the story until you check with me. Instead, mark the story as resolved, add the link to the deliverable inbox or zip one in the comments and assign the story back to me. I will close the story. If not available to validate your deliverable, please share with your team for feedback. If this is the end of the sprint and I'm not available, ask Jennifer, who will validate and close the story. Who is Jennifer? She's my lieutenant. Right, and notice that construct. Do this, if that doesn't work, do this, and if that doesn't work, do number three. Right, that is straight out of Tim Ferriss's four hour work week, ladies and gentlemen. I did not invent this, I would love to claim credit, can't. Right, but what I'm trying to say is I found this to be extremely resourceful because if you phrase it in that way, you account for every eventuality or as many eventualities as you can and then you empower people for independent thought, independent action and you give them a lot of room for creativity and exploration. So rather than being very bounding, right, these policies then become enablement for freedom and exploration. Does that make sense? So that's the right way, in my opinion, to write these. So if somebody keeps asking the same thing over and over again, create a policy, publish it, make it bulletproof if you can, and then get on with your life. So on to part three, Ninja Secrets. My tip number eight is to start with the design framework. Well, what does that mean? It means when we collaborate, a lot of times you have, in a large organization, you have all different time zones. Right, you have people um, doing stand-ups at like 2 a.m. in the morning, your time. Do you, wanna do you really wanna stay up and attend that scrum? Uh, maybe, right? But at the same time, that actually happens quite, quite often, right? So you're, uh, if you have a team like that, what do you do? You have to create bulletproof designs that are gonna stand on their own a little bit, uh, and, that, and that means that you have to over-document a little bit. So that's where the framework comes in. So if anything, I would start with the framework or at least stand it up in parallel. That's the responsibility of those visual design ninjas, right? So by standing it up in parallel, 
you enable developers to work independently without having to ask you questions. Because guess what? If you're not available and they have a question, they're not going to ask you a question. They're not going to wait till the next day. Right. They're going to invent something. And there goes your wonderful design that, you know, your, your flowers in the middle of the, the intersection, right, that you worked on for, <laughs> for three months, all that paint they can work, wasted, gone, right? Because they're going to implement something that's almost, but not entirely, unlike the design that you put together. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Sorry. All right. Obtuse reference there. Uh, one of the coolest, coolest tips, anybody uses Zeppelin.io? A few of you. Uh, check it out. It's, it's the most awesome thing since sliced bread. It's better. It's better because if, you, if you're using Sketch, who's using Sketch? Oh, good. Okay. So if you're using Sketch, you should also be using Zeppelin because all you have to do is just dump your file into Zeppelin, and I believe it's a free plugin unless you're sort of enterprise, then it's really cheap. Uh, anyhow, but it gives you all of the colors, the fonts, the spacing, everything you need to communicate with your developers. So you don't need to create a separate thing in Photoshop. All you have to do is just make sure your, your uh, sketch is really well done, and then you dump it in here, and then it's good to go, right? All the spacing and colors and fonts and, and everything else is done for you by the plugin. So it's really, really nice. But caution, don't do this for every screen. We tried, we got to 100 screens, and every time we had to change something, it was just absolute nightmare because we had to like comb for all of our screens <laughs> and try to figure out where things were, were different, and then communicating that, it, it just was impossible. So instead, what we've done is split it into P two pieces. One was components, um, about 40 screens, you know, the usual uh, visual design guide, colors, and, and, and uh, pieces and navigation and so on, all the pieces, how they work together, forms, etc. And then 20 or so page samples. And in page samples, go ahead and put lorem ipsum delore because that's not a real page, right? And you want to differentiate that, um, that fidelity, right? I never put lorem ipsum, and I tell my team, never do that for the actual deliver deliverables because you want to put at least some kind of placeholder text because that has to communicate with the customer. But for the samples, you want to differentiate that very cleanly and put lorem ipsum and, and just do kind of a sample search page, a sample home page, a sample form, sample pop-up, et cetera. So about, aim for about 20, 20 pages or so. The, and that's going to take the load off your shoulders. That's going to be your framework. And that allows your developers to then work independently and you support them because they are part of your customers. The other tip is to align your entire organization along these key use cases. So what do I mean? So in the Agile, you say, as a Persona X, I can do Y so that I can get benefit Z. And then as an Epic for the developers, you say, as a first-time customer, I can complete my purchase without registering so that I can check out quickly and avoid the hassle of having to create and remember my password. And then when it comes to your design, you create the design used on that Epic, right, Epic and Jira, and then you then test that design with your customers by rephrasing that epic into a question, right, for your customer, a task for your customer. For example, now that you've found what you want to buy, complete your purchase. Is there a way to do so without having to register for the site? And maybe the word register isn't the right word because now it's going to be like hunt, hunt and destroy, right, seek and destroy type of thing. So, um, then you can even probe, you know, why would you want to check out without registering and so on, right? So that's really the key, that you start with the use cases and you build on that and it's the same use case all the way down. So it's like turtles, like turtles on top of the turtle, on top of the turtle. You guys know that joke, right? Yeah, so it's turtles all the way down. So use cases all the way down. So everything rests on top of that foundation that you have validated with customers. My tip number 10 is to have a couple of prototypes. Now, that sounds like a real pain in the butt, but bear with me, right? If you start with the framework of Sketch and wireframe using that, and then you document your design with Zeppelin, uh, as I mentioned, then all you need to do is have a couple of different versions of your um, uh, prototyping software, right? So I love using Envision. Envision is fantastic for everyday communication, anything that involves one or two sprints. It's great to have that. 
Uh, but then there's sort of this additional layer of interactivity sometimes that you need to deliver the vision for your product. And that's where Axer comes in, or maybe even like JavaScript and custom prototypes and so on. Now keep in mind that MVP is not always the goal for what you're doing as a UX team. And this is what I mean by $3.7 billion prototype. Now I would love to show you what that actually looked like, and, um, but I can't, right? As the saying goes, I would have to kill you. So I'm, I'm not going to show it to you, <laughs> or my boss will kill me. But uh, I, I'm not going to show it to you. Just, just keep in mind that it's not always the goal. Sometimes it's about purchasing another company, or mergers and acquisitions, uh, or maybe it's a completely different purpose for that prototype. Now, as UXers, we should welcome that, because that means we are going into the strategy, product strategy, corporate strategy, uh, investment strategy, these are really big, big opportunities for us to not just do good work, but to do good, right? And that's where we can really influence what does that mean for a customer uh, and what does that mean for a planet and the world at large. So those are amazing opportunities, treasure them, make the most of them, right? UX is becoming a true strategic asset for these large companies, they're seeing that, and they are gonna be giving you these opportunities. So don't, don't miss them. Okay, uh, tip number 11, use physical mashups. We, we're in a virtual world, right? These things are difficult to picture sometimes. If you have the opportunity to have a war room, demand it. Demand a war room, if you have the space. Put all your stuff up on the wall. Uh, this was an awesome opportunity because we had this entire wall painted in, in writable, writable white paint. Awesome, if you can get you know, somebody to do that for you, or if you can have your team just get down dirty, come in on the weekend and just paint the whole wall, it's awesome, because you can paste your wireframes onto it, you can print it, paste the wireframes on there, and then you can literally write next to it like different things and draw arrows and, and figure out your information architecture on this large scale uh, setup. So we had 150 screens up uh, on the board at one time once, and then we would have the testing with the customer, and as soon as we would have the testing, we would write the insights on little sticky notes and stick them right on the screen on top. So you can see these kind of yellow stickies on there, that's what they are. And then the next version of the screen would then be pasted on top of that so that you had this whole kind of um, UX archeology. span So if you were to ever question, why did we make that decision? You can go back and just flip through it and go, that's why. It also makes an awesome way to get everybody into the room at these UX meets, get developers in there, and really show them what the heck you're working on. Because sometimes a scrum team only has a very narrow slice of the whole. They can't see the whole vision or the whole product all at once. So it's very inspiring for them to see just that you're not just drawing pictures, right? You're actually basing this on some research and some interaction with customers, and there's actual vision, and there's a finish line. Uh, at the end of the rainbow. So it's a, it's a very, very useful tool. And then uh, last but not least, go build a bot. We talked about bots a lot, and uh, you can even name it asshole if you want. Um, thank you, Mark, for that. That's my, uh, love it. But I, I mean, literally, I invested maybe 20 hours into this. Uh, Microsoft Lewis, Azure, um, I had a bot working on Slack that, that um, you know, use SQL Server as a cloud database, the whole thing's in a cloud, you get bragging rights, you get to learn how the software is deployed in the modern way, and boy, this is so easy. There's, they have videos walking you step by step by step. Multiple authors are, are teaching you step by step process. So you learn everything about intents and entities and how to set up a bot and what, what it can do. So in about 20 hours, you can have a working actual version of an Alexa bot with you, you know, your basic skill set uh, up and running in, in something like Lewis uh, with no GS uh, or minimal coding just to kind of just to play with Lewis. So very, very cool opportunity. If you take one thing away from today is, is really try this out. There's never been a better time to be a developer and, and for us not to do that is, is missing a humongous opportunity. There's no product out there yet that I've seen that cannot benefit from at least exploring how it would look on a bot, or with a chat bot. So, uh, extraordinarily useful investment of 10 to 20 hours, uh, and uh, at a zero cost. 
Uh, and um, this brings up a larger point, because your frameworks are much better than your fancy stuff. And, and this, uh, this wireframe, this gentleman, um, walked, uh, worked in this for uh, three months. And he comes back with this wonderful uh, prototype. And, and it, is, it is not like, like, like those, those handles, you know, those, um, those chopper handles on, on the doors, right? This is like a chopper handle on every seat in a restaurant, right? Just picture that for a second. Let that sink in. Right, so, but this guy is, um, is basically never asked the developer, is this even feasible? Never asked a single customer what is necessary. He just kind of went off on his own and, and did this thing and exploring, and I changed it slightly. It looked a lot more fancy to protect the guilty a bit, but it's, it's all of this vertical space. You have to scroll to even be able to see the content, and he had not taken into account that we have maybe 1,000 data points that are producing uh, a, a, a piece of data every 100 milliseconds. So you can't possibly get that much data in sort of monthly. You have to do compression and so on. So if you really were to do it right, you would then consider a Google Charts, right, to just do a Google Charts and do a simple drop down that's going to solve 80 to 90% of your use cases. Uh, and then you have all that space you saved. And you did not, most importantly, try to reinvent the wheel. So unless your company is really in the business of creating frameworks, don't try to solve a solve problem. Just get something off the shelf. So as designers, it's more about grabbing theses that are available to us as opposed to rewriting everything from scratch. And that's, bots are just a small piece of that, right? But that's sort of the larger, the larger corollary of the, entire, of the entire setup. So am I talking about UX ninjas? Am I talking about UX unicorns? Well, it's kind of like a UX ninja unicorn team. So in conclusion, I know I'm a little over time, sorry. Uh, the product is not the product. I'm sorry, the product is the product, not your wireframes, right? Very important. You have to understand the focus on the company mission. The MVP is not always the outcome you're looking for. And uh, stay true to yourself and your human-centered values. Be flexible just enough and more, Milton Glasser. Remember, and then the last experiment, and try things. And I want to just close with this quote from Eckhart Tolle. Um, I hope that these tips, whether you said sweet ass or stink, right, um, somehow you can take some of this stuff and incorporate and try, just inspire you to try some of this stuff out, uh, because it's up to all of you to inject uh, humanity into our software development process. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.